Good evening. I am delighted uh, to welcome you here on this snowy night in Brunswick because we have a great treat for you. Jill Abramson, who knows who she is? Needs no introduction. Um, she's a journalist, as you know, and an author, but she is also the first and the only woman to serve as executive editor in the 160 year history of the New York Times. And she held that post from 2011 until May. Before that, um, I, I'm gonna read some of these because the, her background is so stunning. She was Washington editor, the first woman to serve as the Washington bureau chief, then managing editor. She covered two wars, four national elections, the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, the BP oil spill, and many, many important stories. In addition, at one point she took a six-month detour and she immersed herself in the Times' digital operations. And I think she's going to talk uh, about that some tonight. But before joining the Times, she was also, for nine years, a reporter at the Wall Street Journal. Now, I first met Jill about a year ago, right at this time. Drew Faust, the president of Harvard, wanted to do a panel of women in power, which I was going to moderate. And I said, well, who would you want to have on this panel? And the first name she mentioned was Jill. So Jill came, and we were in Sanders Theater, and she talked about running this enormous operation. And I particularly liked the fact that at the four o'clock meeting every day, she chose what picture went on the front page of the Times. That's power. <laughs> then came the fall. And I called up Jill because I was then at Harvard Business School. And I said, would you come talk to some of my women students um, who are looking in the business environment. And she came over, and, I, and one of them asked her, well, tell us about this exit from the New York Times. And she said, you mean when I was fired? Now, I have to say, and Jill will, you will hear this from Jill herself, I think in her exit, she also showed and inspired many of these young men, women, and I could see it on the faces of my students in that room, how one, as a powerful woman, deals with the ups and the bumps of life. So tonight, um, we very much look forward to hearing from her. Her talk is entitled Tumultuous Times in Journalism. And then we have an even uh, more special treat because we're gonna bring two of Bowden's own uh, up to the stage. Susan Faludi, who came to Bowden in uh, 2013 as the Taubman Scholar, and she is also a Pulitzer, she's a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and a best-selling author. Her book, Backlash, The Undeclared War Against American Women, won a National Book Critics uh, Circle Award for nonfiction. And Jen Scallon, who is our professor here for Humanities, Gender and Women's Studies, and uh, our Associate Dean of the Faculty. Her book, which I love, is entitled Bad Girls Go Everywhere, The Life of Helen Gurley Brown. So we have a star-studded array. Our Bowdoin faculty members will moderate a conversation with Jill using the questions that you all delivered to us on the white cards in the lobby. Please join me in welcoming our fabulous guest, Jill Abramson. Wow, thanks. Great. Thank you for being here. Thank you all for braving the cold to come out tonight. And I also just want to thank Karen so much for that wonderful introduction. Uh, we have not known each other long, but um, if one theme of the evening tonight is bad girls, I have a sense that we already have like a bad girls uh, tie going on already. So that's great. Uh, and 
You know, I was hoping tonight to a little bit give you an overview of the journalism firmament as I see it these days. Uh, it's an incredible honor to be here at Bowdoin. Uh, and I know, like all of you who are part of this community, probably get sick to death of hearing every visitor like me invoke Harriet Beecher Stowe. But stick with me, I'm going to do it. Sorry. Uh, because, you know, I think that I want to talk tonight about all of the tumult and all of the challenges right now that confront journalism, because we're in the middle of this transformation from really a print-dominated society to a digital-dominated landscape, which is, you know, making topsy-turvy so many aspects of the news and journalism. But I want to actually begin with something that I think is a comforting continuum, because when Harriet wrote her masterful Uncle Tom's, uh, it actually unfolded. It was published over the course of a full year. So I figure like each month, about each month, there was a new installment of Uncle Tom. And by about installment four, readers across what was then America were waiting with bated breath, except maybe in the South, for what was going to happen to Little Eva. And uh, what is that like? That's an awful lot like cereal. Uh, I assume some of you were glued to the cereal podcast, which, you know, in many ways just was echoing the old forms of publishing, uh, either of some of Charles Dickens' novels or Harriet Beecher Stowe's masterwork. Uh, they were released in chunks, and uh, people were waiting with bated breath for the next installment. In fact, uh, when Dickens wrote The Old Curiosity Shop, there were Londoners were practically rioting on the docks. They were like waiting for the next like story uh, injection about Little Nell. It's just the the same thing, and you know people are just in love, and they remain in love with fabulous storytelling and gripping narrative and the story behind the story when you apply it to nonfiction narrative journalism, which is what I've devoted my life to. So I think in a way from Harriet Beecher Stowe to Serial, it is a continuous line. Uh, and Matthew Arnold, I think, had a fabulous definition of journalism. He said, it is storytelling with a purpose. And I think that that is true. And I think sometimes its purpose is to spark anger. You know, some, some of us think anger is not the most attractive part of our emotional palette. It isn't often a healthy impulse in our society, but sometimes provoking the conscience of readers and bringing out their anger is a spark to positive social change. And I've always passionately believed that words matter. And, you know, you think back to their, you know, I'm not going to be tiresome and evoke example after example, but you think back to a simple song lyric. Uh, back in 1937, when Billie Holiday sang the song Strange Fruit, which you know, is a song about lynchings in the South. And that song, back in 1937, really helped create the impetus for the passage by 
Congress of the anti-lynching laws of the late 30s. So words can have immense power. And when they prov provoke anger, as they did in that case, sometimes it can have a healthy effect. And besides tipping my hat to Karen, I also wanted to point out that I'm here mainly because my former Wall Street Journal colleague and friend, Sue Faludi, sent me an email back, I have to admit, in the summer months <laughs> saying, would I think about coming to Bowdoin to give this talk? And I'm thrilled that she did. But I think she's another great example of a courageous journalist who's writing when she wrote the book Backlash, it provoked anger. And over the last summer, this was after I'd been fired from the Times, I reread Backlash. I'd read it when it first came out like 20 years ago and read it with new eyes in 2014. And it still made me boiling mad because so many of the gender-based issues that Sue wrote about um, as problematic back then are still unsolved and with us today. And I like to think that many of us here tonight, and certainly I am trying to dedicate myself still to writing some of the injustices that she wrote about in Backlash. Uh, we are living right now through an incredibly turbulent time in the profession of journalism. Uh, the core foundation questions at the root of journalism are in question. First and foremost is freedom of the press. How free is the press? How free do we want it to be? How free is the US government going to allow it to be? And then a close cousin of that and equally important is what news is fit to publish or broadcast or blog about? Uh, what is the very definition of real news? And I'd like to take a crack at those two issues at the beginning of the of this talk. And first will be freedom of the press. Uh, again, I, I will not, um, I'll try not to anyway be tiresome about historical points, but I think it's very important, especially at a college that has these two magnificent Gilbert Stuart portraits of Madison and Jefferson gracing the second floor of the art gallery here at Bowdoin to talk a little bit about the founders and the role for the press that they envisioned. Uh, we forget, but the founders of our country were deathly afraid of over-centralized power. And they saw the press as the main bulwark against excessive government power. And so, you know, the First Amendment is first for a reason. Uh, they felt unbridled freedom of the press was a key cornerstone of our country's founding. And, uh, you know, Jefferson famously said if he had to choose between a country that had government but no free press or the reverse, he would actually opt for free press and no government. Uh, and that's why I find you know, the stance of the Obama administration as I was involved covering it, extremely perplexing. Uh, between the Bush administration and the Obama administration, there were eight criminal leak prosecutions. That's way more than twice the number of such cases in the history of the country. 
These are criminal cases that are brought under a very obscure provision of federal law. Uh, 1917 Act that was passed uh, at the beginning of World War I that was meant to prosecute spies, and it's called the Espionage Act. And that law has been used in these eight cases to prosecute whistleblowers who leak classified information to reporters. Now, many of these whistleblowers leaked the information because they felt the government, as it had in the period that Jefferson and Madison were so worried about government overreaching, because they saw programs like the rampant, massive espionage programs that Edward Snowden ultimately went to the press about, they saw them as possibly illegal and unconstitutional. Nevertheless, these people can be and were prosecuted in the cases where the government felt confident that they could say who the sources were who leaked this material to the press. You know, a bright spot, and some of you may wonder, why is she yammering about these cases when we know the, that the Obama administration recently decided that they were not going to force Jim Risen, or reporter for the New York Times who worked for me, to testify in the most recent of these prosecutions. And I'm very glad that the government backed off because I know Jim well. I just had lunch with him in Washington not long ago. And he would have gone to jail rather than give testimony about who his source was. Uh, but he wasn't forced to make that choice. But Jeffrey Sterling, who was the defendant in that case, was recently found guilty and he will be sentenced. I don't know how many years in jail he's going to face, but he is going to go to jail. And the main point about these cases is that they put a freeze on the free flow of information between sources and reporters in Washington. Uh, and you may say, well, you know, why are these sources giving reporters classified information? It's illegal, they're not allowed to. But, you know, think back to the Pentagon Papers and Daniel Ellsberg. Uh, why did he leak the 37 volumes of secret Vietnam history to the New York Times back in 1971? He did it because he saw in those documents that the government had told massive lies about how well the Vietnam War was progressing. And he felt it was vitally important for the public to know the truth. And in almost all of these eight leak cases, because I've studied them closely, that same belief is what motivated the source who leaked the material. I don't know if uh, in the movie theaters near Bowdoin, the movie Citizen Four has played. It's a documentary about Snowden, but it's excellent. It gives you a window into like Snowden's soul and why he did what he did. Uh, I, I recommend it. Uh, the national security reporters for the Times have said to me since basically the first day Obama took office that the environment in which they do their reporting has never been more inhospitable than it is at this moment. That sources at the Pentagon, at the CIA, at the NSA, at the Department of Homeland Security, who used to be willing to talk to them, mainly because they wanted the public to have accurate information about the work that goes on in those places, 
don't want to be called by any reporter from the New York Times because they worry that their telephone records can easily be subpoenaed in a leak investigation and they can end up, if not going to jail, having to rack up sizable legal fees. So they just, they don't want to deal with the press anymore. And the consequence of that is that you, the public, are not going to get the information about intelligence programs, many of which are part of the war on terror that's being waged in your name. Uh, but if that war is being waged in your name, I would argue you have the biggest stake in knowing the dimensions of what that war is, the intelligence programs that they entail, and being sure that you're comfortable that they conform with the Constitution and your idea of what appropriate safeguards of the national security are. Um, I had, just to make it personal for a minute, a very memorable day for me was uh, in the summer of 2013. I was then executive editor of the Times and uh, a package had pretty recently arrived in my office uh, and it was on a little disk drive about this big, it was tens of thousands of the Snowden documents. And the reason it was coming to my office is that The Guardian, which was the British newspaper that first reported on the material from Edward Snowden. You know, in, in Britain, they do not have the kind of freedom of the press laws that we have in the US. And what had happened at The Guardian is that the government there had said, basically, to the editor of The Guardian, Alan Rusbridger, you've had your fun now, and you have to, either give all the documents back to the government or we're going to come in with sledgehammers and destroy your computers. What The Guardian opted to do is have British authorities come to the newspaper and watch as they destroyed the computers that had the Snowden material. But um, before that happened, uh, Alan Rusbridger had called me and said, I'm going to send you the documents because I want them safeguarded. You know, the U.S. has much better freedom of the press laws, and maybe we can continue co-publishing these stories with you, which is what happened. Uh, so that's the background. But maybe two weeks after that package arrived, and actually before the Times had published any front page stories uh, based on the documents, because we hadn't reviewed them yet, a very, very British voice called me up and asked me would I come. It was uh, the secretary to the British ambassador. Would I come? to Washington and see him. And, you know, I knew what it was likely about. And I said, you know, of course I would come and see him. So made a, an appointment in early July to go visit him at the British Embassy. And what had happened at about the same time is the Times was about to publish a fairly sensitive story about an intercept of a conversation between an Al-Qaeda official and someone in Yemen. And the contents of that intercepted conversation was so alarming that the US had actually emptied many of its embassies in the Middle East. They thought a terror attack was impending. And one of the national security reporters for the Times in Washington had found this out, and we were publishing a story the next day. And James Clapper, the director of national intelligence, called me. I'll never forget, I was in the middle 
On Fridays, I always am on a Metro North train going to my husband and I have a weekend house. So I was heading to Connecticut on Metro North. I'm in this like very crowded train car. My cell phone rings. It's James Clapper insisting that the Times not publish the story the next day. And I'm like, in such an unsecure location, it isn't funny, but I'm cryptically trying to have this conversation with him and get the gist of it, consulted with our Washington bureau chief and the reporter writing the story. And long story short, we agreed to withhold certain details from the story, but we, we did publish the story. Uh, now, the details we withheld, a competitor of ours published the very next day, which made me kind of furious as an editor. And I decided since I was going to Washington to see the British ambassador that I would go make a visit to Mr. Clapper too, because at this point I felt like the Obama administration had become promiscuous in its request to the Times that we hold out information that I viewed in the public interest uh, from our stories. So, you know, I went from the British Embassy where I was trying to explain our press traditions without confirming that, like, the Times had all the Snowden documents. Uh, at the end of that conversation, the ambassador said to me, would I consider Re returning the material, and I felt he was so polite. He sounded like so British. I thought, oh, I'll be like rude if I just tell him on the spot, no. Like, look like you're being thoughtful. So I said I would consider it overnight and call him the next day, which I did, and I said no soap. I didn't say we had the documents, but I just said, you know, we weren't going to be returning any material. and. You know, Mr. Clapper and I had, you know, an interesting back and forth. Uh, and, you know, he seemed to sort of have his eyes open to the fact that when he was going to the Obama White House for the meetings that preceded their request to the Times and the Washington Post and some other news organizations, to like censor stories and hold them back from publication, that that really was, from our point of view, an extraordinary request. And it troubled me that there is no one designated in the White House to make the sort of free press argument for why the public could benefit from the information. All that was ever talked about at these meetings is what possible harm to national security there could be, but never the thing that would balance it out. And, you know, I have to say in his defense, he was, you know, very, uh, you know, ears open and welcoming to me, whether, you know, it's had an effect. I'm not sure. The Justice Department has just issued new guidelines, which are somewhat better in terms of what the bar for actually subpoenaing reporters and trying to compel their testimony will be. But I'm really, you know, I don't, I have little reason for optimism. And I am, and the word I used is perplexed in the beginning, I am genuinely perplexed why a president who pledged transparency and more openness has been, you know, such a bear about press leaks. Uh, I just think it's a, an interesting question. I don't really have the answer to it. Uh, the second issue I want to bring up with you is just, you know, the vexing issue that any editor has to deal with about what news, what stories are fit to print. And, you know, the, the New York Times used to play a real gatekeeper role. Like when the Times would withhold news or not run a story or a graphic photograph or anything of that nature. It would have a ripple effect through the rest of what was always called the mainstream media 
and no one else would publish it. That is no longer true. I mean, basically, we have entered a phase where there are no gatekeepers for all practical purposes. And, you know, the, the, the Times is still struggling with that reality. It's trying to stay true to its values and standards. Uh, but it just doesn't play the same gatekeeper role. And as an example of that, I'll throw at you just the tragic recent story involving the Jordanian pilot who was burned to death in the cage. The Times and other publications uh, of its ilk decided that they were not, certainly not going to publish on its site the 22-minute video of the pilot being burned to death. So not have the video. And in terms of the images that the Times was going to publish, they drew the line. They showed the pilot with the cage in the backdrop, but nothing after that. But, you know, and that is true to the Times' standards and image of itself, which I admire and try to uphold every day that I work there, that it is, you know, a civilized publication and that it does not publish the most prurient or offensive kinds of material, but the truth is is that the whole 22-minute video was like all over social media in no time. Uh, if you wanted to see the goriest aspects of what happened, it was easy to see it. And what's, what interested me is not so much the Times' approach to that story, but the approach of BuzzFeed, which is a relatively new digital native publication, uh, which took a very different approach. And some of you may know BuzzFeed as, I mean, what they're most famous for is kind of vertical uh, photo streams of adorable puppies and kittens and they have achieved success through stories and images that quote unquote go viral. Virality is their business model. So lots of eyeballs, lots of shareable information. Uh, but in the past two years, their Im ambitions have grown and they have wanted to become a quality news site too. So along with the adorable puppy pictures and listicles, they're kind of addicted to like the 10 things you need to know about Ebola or any subject, kind of very catchy things that are going to be clickbait. They've been doing investigative stories and really some absolutely marvelous journalism. Uh, but they decided that they would publish some of the more graphic images. And uh, what, what they, they put out a statement, and I think it, it's just, it's fascinating to me. They said, this was a BuzzFeed statement. We are not a protective barrier or an artificial wall between the news and our readers. We avoid being prurient, but this horrific incident can't be, science, can't be sanitized. And what they do is they give their readers a warning that what they're about to look at is horrible and upsetting, et cetera. Um, but they publish it because I think that that is an interesting position. They are, you know, position that as a news organization, they shouldn't be, quote unquote, a barrier between the news and the public. Uh, I don't know which model is the right model, but it's an illustration 
of why I think, you know, the journalistic firmament is so interesting and full of tumult right now. I'll, uh, I'll go for about five more minutes just with the, the broad view of uh, what's going on. Uh, you know, we, you know, the, the, the Times is in a, a unique situation because its business model is quality journalism. And I think the Times is going to succeed. I think the Times, you know, is an irreplaceable institution in our society. There is nothing like it. It, you know, employs about 1,100 journalists who are so dedicated and full of passion to bring you the news. And uh, I think all things considered, you know, it was a traditional newspaper that when I first came to work there in 1997, you know, there was one deadline that we thought about. It came at nine o'clock at night, right before the presses rolled. Now we live in a 24 seven news world where readers expect news to be, you know, covered exactly when it happens, where it happens and, get to them almost instantly. And uh, the distribution system is not, you know, a bunch of newspapers coming off the presses, but it's what's published on the Times website, on its apps, and then what is picked up and echoed in social media. Because if you were going to ask me who is the most influential person in journalism right now, I'd have a hard time picking whether it's, you know, the executive editor of the New York Times or the guy at Facebook who does the algorithm, the engineer at Facebook who does the algorithm for Facebook's news feed. The Facebook news feed reaches many more people than the Times executive editor does. And the Times in many ways is dependent on that engineer to have its quality news picked up and amplified and brought to you. So, you know, it's a completely different world than the world I confronted when I joined the Times. Uh, you know, it's become fashionable for a journalist like me who cut her teeth in the best print newsrooms like the Times or the Wall Street Journal to bemoan the bad influence that social platforms have had on the news. But keep in mind, the top story on Twitter back in 2013 wasn't Miley Cyrus. She was number three. Uh, it was the Boston Marathon bombing, a serious news story. And the most viral story in 2013 was a fascinating New York Times interactive feature that figured out exactly where your regional dialect, your pattern of speech came from. It was called How Y'all Yows and You Guys Talk. Um, let's admit it, entertainment values suffused the news long before Mark Zuckerberg came along. People Magazine always swamped time on the newsstand. And in many ways, Facebook and Twitter have strengthened the news and made the fierce urgency of now more compelling than ever. My first lesson of how Facebook could literally power a news story came in 2011 during Hurricane Irene. I was worried that our computers at the Times were going to be knocked out. And with no television, how is the Times going to cover the story in real time? Some of the Times' digital ed editors developed on the fly an interactive hurricane track tracker and used the Times' Facebook page and other social platforms to publish crucial news about the storm as it raged through New York. Readers' iPhone pictures augmented the reporting of Times journalists and photographers. In the digital present, everyone can be a publisher. That's a democratizing force in journalism. For sure, this ability carries risks too. The manic competition to file a story can breed careless, error-prone reporting 
or not give correspondents or photojournalists the time they need to think through their story enough to provide readers with a deeply reported, well-presented story that honors their intelligence. I worked very closely with two successive New York Times correspondents who covered the Supreme Court, and both worried, and rightfully so, that the, the pressure to report end-of-term decisions as they were handed down didn't leave them with enough time to think or to really analyze what the decisions meant. And so the answer that I came up with is one that the Times website still uses from time to time, to just say to readers, come clean and say, quote, we are reporting this story and we will soon have something up, and occasionally to report what other news organizations are saying, like according to CNN, this decision says blah, blah, blah. You know, that shows that the Times isn't sitting there clueless that other people are reporting the story, but it kind of reflects the truth, which is the Times feels the subject needs further fact-finding and analysis. Readers are often smarter than we think. They honor accuracy more than instant gratification. They can handle long stories if they are well-reported and offer something unique. The Times recently ran a story about a campus assault that took up three pages inside the Sunday main news section. It was tremendously well read online because it was both informative and a gripping narrative. These stories can take months to report and edit, but they are what distinguishes the journalism and quality newspapers like the Times, the Wall Street Journal, the FT, and other publications that you may value. I'd like to dwell just at this end on two areas of journalism that I think have been profoundly affected by the rise of social platforms, international and political coverage. Candidly, the effects have not always been health healthy and are sometimes disturbing. For most of our history, think about it, war has been witnessed only in the rearview mirror. It took weeks for Matthew Brady's photographs or eyewitness accounts of the battles of the Civil War to reach readers. Vietnam was the first war to reach Americans in their living rooms on TV. And some live coverage began during the first Gulf War. That all seems so quaint in a world where both journalists and citizens are uploading instant images of war's ravages in Gaza or other places, um, or the bloody aftermath of things like the plane going down in the Ukraine, or the Jordanian pilot's sad fate. Journalists begin writing about what they are seeing on Twitter at the instant they witness events. Scenes of disaster and chaos are everywhere. This can inform, but it can also just shock and overwhelm. Some correspondents, like a woman who was a correspondent for CNN and quickly tweeted about Israeli soldiers who harassed her um, and called her scum, have run into trouble with Twitter, with using Twitter as their bu bugle. She said some ill-advised things and lost her job. Other Journalists have done incredible, inspiring things. Tyler Hicks, a Pulitzer Prize winning photographer for the Times, witnessed those four small pa Palestinian boys who were playing one minute and killed the next. He tweeted out that news, he was the only journalist there, posted hard to look at photos, and then wrote a memorable piece about what it was like to be there for the next day's newspaper. Matthew Arnold, the poet and critic, called journalism literature in a hurry, and Tyler was creating a valuable first draft of history in a hurry. The dark side of social platforms have, has also been on display. They give propaganda, which has always been part of modern warfare, a megaphone. That's what makes the editorial decisions about running ISIS's propaganda snuff film videos so difficult. Facebook and Twitter can't begin to monitor the hateful posts that have swamped both sides of something like the Gaza conflicts. 
extremists have flocked to hashtag Gaza under attack, and promoters of Israel have flocked to hashtag Israel under fire. The Israeli Defense Ministry now has a 40-person staff in its public affairs department devoted solely to posting on social platforms and YouTube. Social media has, as Jody Rudoran, the Middle East correspondent for the New York Times recently wrote, put propaganda on steroids. In the US, we're approaching the 2016 election. Political coverage is now dominated by what I call scooplets, saucy bits of gossip that highlight campaign conflicts or gaffes without the substance of issues or ref reflecting in any way how politics really affects people's lives. The campaign gossip fire hose is always on. Twitter is how political news is started and amplified. It's good that Facebook co-sponsored some GOP debates in 2012, and the first debate between o Obama and Romney actually set a record for tweets, 1.1 million. You can watch candidates' ads on YouTube or Vimeo. In, fact, in 2000, just think about it, the fact that candidates even had websites was revolutionary. But the fire hose leaves me pining for the deep reporting of a Theodore H. White. It's rare to find history or context in political stories now, or in any kind of human understanding of what the candidates are like as people. I hope, I'm not sure it will be, but 2016 may have some better coverage. A piece I read recently and liked a lot called for a movement called slow reading, kind of like slow cooking. I think there's something to this. Um, ha having joined uh, the teaching ranks this year, I've been assigning my favorite long pieces of narrative nonfiction, tracing the arc from profiles by Gay Talese in the 1960s to Jane Mayer's amazing investigative stories in The New Yorker. And I find the students I'm teaching just love those stories. So I love teaching them, and it's thrilling to see my students savoring these stories like they would a slow-cooked meal. I think it's maybe the antidote to all of the information that's washing over us and a reading culture that I sometimes worry has massive ADD. And with that, I hope Susan and some of your questions will also come to me, but thanks a lot. How do you want us to sit? <laughs> right here? Here? Yeah. Thank you, everybody. So I have questions from the audience. And Susan, who is a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, has her own <laughs> questions. So we thought Such we pleasure. might alternate, Jill. And sure. Ask you some questions. So, oh, Susan? And I'll, I can read some of those. And too. you can too. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, thank you. That was wonderful. And I think um, we're, we're grateful to, to hear your um, homage to slow food storytelling. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I, I know from when, when you talked this afternoon that uh, a lot of students came up to me afterwards to say how much they appreciate it. I think there's. You know, this assumption that the younger generation well, there are hope, just right. right. There's like we're, um, the, I think the dismay for firehose journalism crosses the generation. So you all can weigh in on that. I don't, um, but I, I, I feel that's true. I, I want, um, you know, I want to go back to the day that you. It was announced that you were uh, the uh, the first 
that you were uh, the editor-in-chief and executive editor of the Times and you gave, you talked to the um, newsroom and you thanked um, your sister journalists and female forebears at the Times and I was really struck by that because a lot of women when they get put in a position of authority are um, you know, don't want to be, you know, don't like to be identified as the woman, um, uh, fill in the blank, or, or identified with women. And so I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what, you know, made you take a different path. I think, Susan, what made me take a different path is I felt that day and I feel today that, you know, the most exciting and meaningful thing that happened in my career is that I was the first woman to be executive editor of the New York Times. I was so proud of that, but I was extremely conscious that the only reason that I was the first woman executive editor was truly because of all of the fighting and hard work of so many women on whose shoulders I stood. And, you know, the one, like, Times colleague who you guys are kicking yourself over the one person that you overlooked or didn't mention, but I didn't, I like, I felt like kicking myself afterwards, I didn't mention Betsy Wade. And Betsy Wade, it's not like she's a world famous journalist, but she was the first woman copy editor at the New York Times. And the copy editors at the New York Times are the ones who make the Times the Times. They sweat every comma. They're geniuses. And Betsy Wade in the 1970s put her name on a lawsuit against the New York Times. It was a sex discrimination suit. It was based on all kinds of evidence about women not being, you know, being paid like 60 cents on the dollar compared to a man, you know, the horrible lack of promotions and opportunities for women. That case took years to crawl its way through the courts. Ultimately, it settled, you know, with the Times. And there were, a, Time Magazine was sued. All of the major networks and publications were sued by women back in the 70s. And you know, for Betsy, it's not like the results of that lawsuit paid off. I think her reward for filing the lawsuit was she got assigned the graveyard shift while she still had little kids at home and she was working late at night. And, but without that, those lawsuits, which really did put the pressure on, you know, the leaders of newsrooms back then to get serious about finding women to hire, promoting them, like nurturing their careers, there would have been no Jill Abramson. I benefited from that push. Going back to when you and I worked at the Wall Street Journal and I took my first job being, you know, a senior editor there. Uh, they were looking at that point under some heat for women to promote. So I was completely conscious that day that, like, I, uh, you know, owed far more than a debt of gratitude and a few lines in my speech to not only people like Betsy, who I forgot, but people like Janet Robinson, who was then the CEO of the Times, and I think fought like crazy to see me get that job. I, when I uh, was a co one of those little uh, copy kids right out of college at the New York Times for, for a year, and I had this 7 p.m. to 3 in the morning shift, yeah. and Betsy Wade mm -hmm. was there. I mean, it was <laughs> yeah. literally the graveyard shift. Still being punished. Yeah. <laughs> 
She, of course, didn't view it as punishment. She's the kind of professional that's going to do a great job yeah. no matter what hours yeah. they gave her. She's pretty great. So a number of people in the audience are really interested in the gender issues related to your work, as you were just talking about. So I'll read you one of these um, numerous questions. What would you say about this Catch-22? Women are faulted for not negotiating for salary and benefits. And of course, we know this was one of the issues mm -hmm. related to your leaving the Times. Um, but they have also been considered problematic when they do. That, that is a great question. I think it is a catch-22. But I think that, that the catch-22 results from the fact that rather than kind of in a, at the best possible point, which is before you take a new job, actually asking what did my predecessor earn mm -hmm. in a just factual, calm, mm -hmm. unemotional way, that often the salary issue comes up as a grievance because and that, you know, in, in my case was true that instead of doing the due diligence factually at a good time, you some a woman can find out somehow she is being paid less or not what she sees as a fair salary and somehow like as it comes up, it's seen as like an angry thing as mm -hmm. opposed to just a business-like thing, mm -hmm. a transaction like any other. And for some reason, I think women typically less frequently than men just do that basic <laughs> due diligence at the front end of finding out what was the set salary? What should their salary be? And like negotiating it at a less fraught moment. Mm -hmm. So negotiating at the beginning and trying to be dispassionate about it might be your advice to students going out into business. Yeah, there's nothing kind, just... like somehow I don't know. It's not only women. It's sometimes mm -hmm. men, too. It's mm -hmm. like you feel we're not supposed to ask about money, but mm -hmm. everyone does. And mm -hmm. it's part of working life. Right. One um, aspect that uh, in the aftermath of the recent unpleasantness that didn't, I, I feel didn't get enough coverage at all was the ways in which you um, work to bring along women in the times. And I, I wondered if you could talk about that and both the challenges of that and... Well, you know, that sort of, it's linked to the, the question that you asked about my first remarks. I did not make it a secret at the times that I intended uh, to make the newsroom more diverse than it had been across the board. And that, you know, I would put an emphasis on promoting qualified women. And after my first year as executive editor, uh, half of the news masthead, that's the list of the top editors that gets published in the newspaper every day. Uh, we got uh, half the sky uh, for the first time. And I you know, saw that as a tremendous achievement. And still, if you were going to ask me probably for the top five things I'm proudest of from my tenure, that would definitely be one of the top five. Uh, but you know, it, 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 more than once, I think, while I was still at the Times and certainly after I was fired, 
the title of your book, Backlash, would float into my brain because I I'm don't think that. everybody <laughs> in that newsroom shared my view mm -hmm. that like having a strategy to do that was the right or proper thing, which surprised me, frankly. Mm -hmm. And you were saying or I could, earlier in the afternoon that it wasn't um, wasn't just men who were uh, yeah, responding that I way. Don't, it was women you know, in the newsroom. I I'm not sure, like because a little bit the preamble to your question about you know the my first remarks to the newsroom were. I don't know. There are some, you know, women as not only in journalism but in many spheres of biz business life who don't want to call attention to gender. It makes them uncomfortable to have someone in a leadership capacity do it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I think there's still, you know, big road to travel, and that it's very important to. Be mindful of that and give voice to that. But I realize not all women feel that way. I mean, the thing that's interesting is the way Susan and I reconnected was over the summer, there was an online reading group uh, to, to read Backlash, you know, published like almost 20 years ago and new to a new generation of working women. Uh, it was a multi-generational online reading club, and I think I represented, it, represented the ancien regime. Uh, <laughs> but um, it, that fascinated me. I mean, there were very divergent views about your book. There were like some women in that online book group who were like very critical of things you wrote that I'm like, huh? It's just like so evidently true, but not, you know, to some other women of a different generation. So it's, it's terrifying to meet the readers. <laughs> I'm sure you know from your own writing. So there's a question here about um, the importance of diversity in newsrooms and sort of more broad, you know, broadly thinking about what difference does it make when there's a diversity of people in the news asking questions? And the um, question specifically is, should news organizations today become more diverse? And maybe you could speak about it well, sort I, of in no, a No, I think the ways. answer to that is yes, and you know the mission of a news organization is to cover the world. And if you only have a certain type of journalist working in a newsroom, how are you going to do that? And you know, I I think it's interesting. Uh, just there was a lot of criticism in the early days of the Ferguson story right. that the mainstream media was very slow mm -hmm. to like get on that story and that really it was a Twitter story. It was people who saw the images of a dead body like laying in the, the street that kind of forced the media to cover it as a news story. And I do think a lack of diversity is connected to that sort of mm -hmm. slowness, to realize that, wow, you know, that's a big story. Uh, and that if you had a more diverse newsroom, there would be more people plugged into what is happening on the ground and paying attention to the right things. And how much would you say that's happened at the New York Times? I think the New York Times is trying hard. Mm -hmm. I really do. It's hard. Journalism, you know, it isn't one of the highest paying professions and the best, you know, black and Hispanic and Asian American 
professionals, I have lots of job options. And, uh, and it's hard to just work in a predominantly white organization. It just is. And, mm -hmm. But I think the Times is making very heartfelt attempts to be more diverse. Uh, mm -hmm. But, you know, it's not something that's going to be accomplished in one year or even a few years, mm -hmm. but very important. Mm -hmm. So I, I think there are uh, a lot of students here who are interested in writing, and um, I, I, I wanted wanted to get you to talk a little bit about your entry into journalism in the '70s and what it, you know, both what it was like for you, just as a uh -huh. cub reporter and and as a woman, and also, and tell me if I've gotten this wrong. But, it was your first story or one of your first stories while you were still in college. You were vacationing in yeah. Nantucket. <laughs> uh -huh. And you, here's, you're, you're just minding your own business on the beach. And um, uh, the news breaks that in Nantucket, Joseph Kennedy had been in that, a and, terrible Jeep accident. And a young woman is paralyzed. So here you are, like one of your first stories, and you're suddenly facing the, the Kennedy dynasty juggernaut. And, um, and, Curious how you handled all that, and, and also if you could just talk a little bit about what, you know your 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 entree into journalism, what that was like. Well, that that Jeep accident's a terrible thing. It was a terrible event, but it was my big break. <laughs> uh, and you know the and idea. This is right after Chappaquiddick, right? Or this was yes. Years this after. was in the period where the idea that there was a Kennedy curse was alive in the media because it was after Chappaquiddick and many other terrible things that befell the family. And this was like the next generation having terrible things happen. Uh, and I wish I could say, you know, I did some amazing investigative reporting on that story. I didn't. Uh, my, I, I was working, I had done no journalistic experience at all. I was working that summer at a Hickory Farms cheese store <laughs> by day and by night at Preston's Airport Lounge, which was like one of the great dive bars of all time. Uh, but I was spending the summer, my parents rented a place. Uh, with them and my father had become friendly with one of the chief doctors on the island and uh, the reason Time Magazine called me in the first place to report on this is that Nantucket was all fogged over and the ferry wasn't even running and planes weren't landing and a family acquaintance of mine worked in the Boston Bureau of Time Magazine and remembered that I was there and called me and said, if you can get anything, it will help us. And so my father went off to do something with the doctor who, because of Hippocratic Oath, wasn't going to be revealing details anyway. But his wife was always kind of <laughs> bored. And she somehow, in the fog, migrated down to like our house. And I remember to this day, she liked, it was kind of cocktail hour, she liked to drink vodka <laughs> and grapefruit juice. And she would just knock these things back one after another. And it would like, I would like be thinking about how, like what a bad stomach ache I would have with all that vodka and grapefruit juice sloshing around. But anyway, she was kind of on her second drink. And I didn't even have to ask a question. I mean, she just like started spilling like all of the details about this accident and the condition of 
the woman who was hurt and whether alcohol was involved. And you know, I just sat and kind of listened. And when she left, I called the person I knew at Time Magazine. I, I knew enough to say, I cannot tell you the identity of my source. <laughs> but yeah, I was able to give this information. And like they were happy to like have it when I got back to Harvard that fall, they hired me to be what was called the stringer, which is a mm. part-time reporter for time. And that really was my start. But, you know, in terms of being a young woman, I, you know, I graduated from Harvard in 76, and that was a presidential election year. And, you know, I was sent by time to New Hampshire. To, I have to admit, I wasn't, I was covering some of the lesser candidates in the Democratic primary. But, you know, I went up there and I remember, at, you know, what, as the vote was coming in, you know, it was when Jimmy Carter was running, being at the Sheraton Wayfair Hotel in New Hampshire, which is still the press hub uh, during the New Hampshire primary. And I remember like looking at the bar and there was like Hunter Thompson and wow. John Chancellor and David Brinkley and Johnny Apple of the Times and David Broder of the Washington Post and Jack Germond of the AP and I, not, I was not only the youngest person in the room, but I was like the only woman in the whole bar. Mm -hmm. And you know, I just sort of stood there like gazing at these like lions of political reporting and just never imagining that like I would ever be at that bar. Uh, but you know, Even though I your got training, there. your first job was at the bar, right? I know. I'm going to have to like was very 2016. Convenient. I'm going to have a vodka and grapefruit juice at that bar. Uh, so I'm not sure what the what the lesson is of the Nantucket story, but um, one learn of to the, mix uh, drinks. Learn to mix drinks. Perhaps, yeah, some skills come in handy no matter what. Um, I don't know if you engage in show and tell, but um, there's some interest in your tattoos. Oh, <laughs> well, they're so not. It's perhaps not, you could it's tell too us. hard. I'm wearing a dress. <laughs> perhaps you could tell us I a little bit show. about your tattoos. Yeah, I mean, I don't. I, this always sounds kind of pretentious because, I mean, tattoos are tattoos. But um, I got my first one when I turned 50 and I got it because I was moving back. I lived in Washington, D.C. for 22 years. I was moving back to New York where I grew up probably for forever to become managing editor of the New York Times. And so I thought I want to get a tattoo and I want it to be something New York something definitive about New York. And I didn't want an apple. Who wants an apple tattoo? <laughs> that would be too no. hip or cool. So um, I completely overthought this. But finally, I settled. I have a New York City subway token was that tattoo. And that was my first. And Anyone who has ta a tattoo knows you immediately become obsessed with more tattoos. <laughs> uh, um, but I exercise a lot of self-discipline. I decided I'm only going to allow myself to be tattooed every decade. So the, the token was 50, but when I turned 60, Last year, I got three more. <laughs> <laughs> and I got, um, I got a Crimson H for Harvard, because that's where I went. I got a Times Roman T for the Times. And then, because I just, because I think it's beautiful, I got kind of a round to match the token. Uh, I got the, the, the state 
CEO of South Carolina, where my husband and I lived, like very early in our relationship, and had such an interesting time. And what's pretentious is I kind of view the tattoos a little bit like it, they're like my hieroglyphics. They're like each of them is like a little piece of my life story. So I don't know, I, I'm entertaining. You guys can make suggestions for when I turn 70, what, what, I, should, what I should do. <laughs> I, think, I think the vote here would be the polar bear, polar bear or maybe not. <laughs> maybe we're all tired of the polar bear. I don't know, I was eyeing. They have these really cute sweatpants in the Bowdoin bookstore that have the paw prints on oh, yeah. them. That's yeah, 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 paw prints could be a good tattoo. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, um, when you and I were, were starting out in journalism, or at least I know when I was, and, and probably with you too, because you were just a few years earlier, um, there were really about a third of women in the newsroom, and now today, it's, about the same. it's exactly the same. And at the same time, you know, women at the top made some improvements, uh, but there was uh, just a report out you probably you know about um, from the Neiman yeah. that um, found that the top in the you know top um, 25 newspapers it's in worse. the country, it's worth has gone from. Um, seven in 2004 down to three women in yeah, 2014. Yeah, I mean, it's just self-evident, too. We think, I mean, not that, I mean, the network new, nightly news broadcasts aren't, you know, when I was saying in my earlier remarks that there are no gatekeepers, I mean, the nightly news shows aren't what they were when I was like a little girl and families would gather in the living room and watch the news together. But still, I mean, it was just, you know, a year ago that we had Diane Sawyer was an anchor of ABC, you know, Katie Couric, for whatever people think of her, was, you know, mm -hmm. the CBS anchor. Uh, Christiane Amanpour had a much larger profile at CNN than she does now and went to one of the networks. I mean, it is Guy City now. Uh, all of the network news broadcasts at night are men. Mm -hmm. so and the, so that's... What's going on? And I mean, in the newsroom, too. I mean, in the print world Right, as no, well. it's like... Any theories <laughs> of what we as can to do? Like, <laughs> Well, it, it's difficult because I thought the answer to this was being proactive mm -hmm. and, you know, trying to find the best women around. And there's no shortage of great women. That mm -hmm. isn't the problem. The problem, it, you know, it used to be the men in charge would say, oh, the pipeline, mm -hmm. you know, the pipeline isn't mm -hmm. full of enough, like, qualified candidates. That just isn't true anymore. Uh, but, I mean, I'm not sure that given how things c came out, and I, I don't want to all be suggesting this was the reason I was fired by the Times, but, you know, I, I'm not sure, like, such a bold approach of promoting lots of women at once is necessarily a su successful strategy mm -hmm. either. Mm -hmm. So I'm not, I'm not sure what will like change it. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what do you think? You're, you're the expert here. You know, two steps forward, one step back. And yeah. now it seems like it's one step forward, two steps back. And, and maybe a feeling that, oh, well, we've done that. So it's, we can move on. We don't need to worry about it anymore. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm really flummoxed by it because there's certainly no shortage of women, like you said. Right. I mean, it's interested. not a pipeline problem. And, uh, at journalism all. schools have been more than like two thirds female for the last you know, 20 years. So it's, um, it's extremely troubling. 
It is, but I don't, you know, I don't think it's a, you know, it's a, not a front burner issue for, you know, lots of people. I don't, I'm not sure, mm -hmm. like, the, I mean, the audience at the end of the day, readers and the audience are going to have to care about it, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure they do. Mm -hmm. Do you think they do? Well, we have an audience here. We do, we have an audience Do we here. care? Um, you know, clearly we, we uh, yeah, we have work to do um, and we have inspiration to do it. So Jill Abramson, thank you oh, so, much so much for being with us today.